Um, so sailors' rights uh, involves impressment, um, and again, this is the, the Royal Navy, so such as here, you see a Royal Navy officer sort of squinting at American sailors, deciding whether he, he should grab them or not. Um, but, but in fact, it's, it's often a, a, not a very civil process. This illustration would lead you to conclude that it's uh, all very polite. It's not. The, the Americans fight back, um, and, and uh, they're not happy to be imp impressed. Uh, there, there's a case of impressment up uh, oh, down, down east on the main coast where a, a British naval schooner seizes an American ship and, it, and, and you know, <laughs> the, the, the Royal Navy officer is telling, telling these guys, okay, you're coming with us. And they're like, no, we're not. <laughs> and, and they said, no, really, you are. And, and, and you get into this ridiculous farce where the, where the American sailors are, are literally holding onto the mast like this. They got their hands locked and the Royal Navy sailors are, you know, <laughs> yanking them off. And, and they do. They, 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 they uh, pull them away. You know, beat on them with the flats of their swords, and, and the Americans let go, and they, they haul them off to uh, St. John, New Brunswick, uh, and off into the Royal Navy they go. And again, this, this impacts locals. The most famous example is a fellow named John Nichols from uh, uh, Durham, just, just up the road here. Uh, he's not afloat when he's impressed. He's the uh, first mate on a vessel in, in Britain, and he's on shore and uh, a press gang seizes him. <coughs> he says, wait, I've got paperwork. Stop, it's, you, know, you, you, you can't do this. It, a, you're not supposed to do this to officers, and B, I'm an American citizen, and C, I've got papers that say you're not supposed to do this, and, and they, they ripped up the papers. We, we don't care. Um, his captain uh, and, and local business people came and appealed to the Royal Navy, uh, all to no avail. Uh, and and uh, off he went into the Royal Navy and, and corresponded back and forth. I mean, he's deeply unhappy. He gets his, his father to send another uh, set of documents that establish he's, he's an American, and uh, none of that works. And uh, so he's in the Royal Navy in 1812 uh, when war breaks out between the United States and Britain. Actually, what happens is Congress declares war on Britain, and there are about well, the, the general number is thought to be about 10,000 American sailors are serving in the British Navy in 1812. So now they're serving in a Navy that is fighting their own nation. Uh, and they're, they're put in a very awkward spot. And in Nichols' case, uh, if, if he's the right guy I'm thinking about, he, uh, he goes to his captain and says, Sir, I, I'm an American. I don't want to fight against my own nation. I am requesting to be made a prisoner of war as a matter of conscience. And the captain says, no, I need your services, and uh, proceeds to have him taken to the gangway and given a dozen lashes. Uh, he's whipped. Uh, and, and Nichols is a stubborn fella, uh, and, and he refuses. He says, no, really, I still want to be a prisoner of war. Uh, the next day, they go through the same performance, uh, and then for a third day, they go through this performance for a total of 36 lashes, uh, and at that point, uh, the commander of this vessel says, fine, I don't want to see you again, uh, has him chucked into prison, uh, and, and doesn't give him his clothes or uniforms, his, his, his seaman's bag or anything, Just, you're gone. You know, didn't, really didn't want to uh, deal with this troublesome American anymore, and certainly <coughs> wasn't going to make his life comfortable. Um, there are other local examples. There's a great one from, and, and an important one from Cape Elizabeth, where uh, uh, an apprentice shipbuilder was sailing to New York City from Portland, and uh, he was impressed. He wasn't even a sailor, and, and he was impressed by uh, a well-known British frigate, uh, HMS Guerriere, uh, which will be a, 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 an important one in the War of 1812, because USS Constitution will uh, uh, defeat it in battle rather handily. Uh, so he seized, and, and the, the American public is outraged by this. Uh, they complain bitterly to the British, and the US Navy, uh, this is in 1810, if I recall correctly, uh, is put on alert, and they begin scouring coastal waters looking for this British frigate, the Guerriere, uh, they don't find it, but uh, an American frigate does come across a British warship in the dark of night uh, and ends up firing on it with uh, a no warning uh, and overwhelms the British.
ship, which is called the Little Belt. Uh, and uh, you know they're they're looking for this this kid from Maine that they don't find him, and, and they they apologize and let the British warship go. Uh, the, the British aren't very happy about it, uh, and and that's all part of the, the downward spiral towards war in 1812. Now back home, uh, here in Maine, there is a lot of political turmoil, as there is across the nation. And, and, and the issue is largely the ideals of this gentleman here, Thomas Jefferson, who is uh, propounding a new kind of politics based on elevating the uh, ordinary white man. He's, he's not especially interested in liberating women. Uh, uh, and, and empowering them and, and, and really pushing the nation towards democracy. This is deeply resented uh, by the status quo and, and a, a political party that we like to call the Federalists. Right? And, and the Federalists are strong in Maine in 1800, but they're, they're losing power gradually. Um, but there's, there's a lot of bitterness in these politics. I think, I think much worse than, than the politics you're seeing today. Uh, and the great examples in North Yarmouth, um, the local postmaster in North Yarmouth is a Jeffersonian. Uh, that's how you get to be postmaster, right? You're, you're a, a political hack. He has a, a sloop down, down at a, a, a pier near his home in North Yarmouth. And, and one night, uh, a crowd of people, Federalists, who apparently not only don't like Jefferson, but they don't like the postmaster either, attack this sloop and they, they cut all the, the lines so it drifts off almost, it, they, they forgot one. Um, but the really alarming thing that they do is that they paint black paint in several places all, all over this schooner, Black Sal and Jefferson. Now, of course, Black Sal is Sally Hemings, so who, 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 who is Jefferson's mistress right, at the time. I mean, this is, wow, you know, toxic, toxic. <laughs> stuff, uh, and uh, uh, you know, it's an attack on the postmaster and, and a political statement all at the same time. Uh, the postmaster's daughter hears the ruckus and, and throws up the window sash and sees people running away. Uh, there must have been something really bad going on in North Yarmouth because uh, a little bit later, actually I think a, a year and a half later, uh, a brick comes flying through her window, uh, and she gets very dangerously cut up uh, by this, and, and her father puts an ad in the Portland newspapers with a $500 reward. $500 in 1810, leading to uh, uh, you know, the, the arrest of these characters, which doesn't seem to happen. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the story was with this young woman. I, I, she never married. Uh, and, and lived with her parents, as far as I can tell, her whole life. I'm not sure if she, she didn't have a disability or, 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 or something. Uh, but uh, boy, the, the, you know, ugly stuff in North Yarmouth. <laughs> All right. Uh, the big pr prelude to war is uh, uh, is another incident involving impressment back in 1807 called the Chesapeake incident. And what happened is uh, an American frigate called the Chesapeake was sailing from Norfolk, Virginia towards the Mediterranean and basically was intercepted by a Royal Navy vessel that was looking for deserters from the British Navy who had then joined up in the American Navy. Um, and they're there. I mean, the, the Chesapeake, there, there's no doubt that there were uh, some British deserters on board this vessel, but the, the British warship fires without, war without much warning uh, into the American vessel uh, repeatedly. Uh, the Americans were not prepared for this, uh, and in fact, they only get one uh, shot off uh, at, back at the British uh, when a midshipman, uh, a junior officer, a, a youngster, right, a, te a teenager, uh, runs to the galley and with his bare hands picks up a live coal from the stove and runs to a cannon and uses that to touch off the cannon and fire it. And he probably mangles his hand pretty good in the process, but uh, uh, it's the only shot we, we were able to fire back. Uh, gets him promoted from midshipman to uh, lieutenant, by the way. Uh, uh, he's the only one who come, comes out of this hole. 
sorry if they're uh, doing well. Th this almost leads to war with Britain uh, in 1807. Uh, and we're, we're unhappy with the British at, at many levels. Uh, and this results in uh, President Jefferson realizing that the United States, while we certainly had huge, huge problems with the British, we are also completely unprepared to fight this war. So his answer to that is rather than declare war on Britain immediately, is to try to punish the British in a different way, which is a series of trade restrictions called the embargo, uh, sometimes called Jefferson's embargo or the long embargo. Uh, it lasts from 1807 to 1809. And, and, and again, you, you have, uh, it shows the division in Maine communities because there are some people who like the, Jeff the Jefferson administration, including the porters who are you know, back and forth between Freeport and Portland, who support the measure, and other Mainers who do not uh, and who break this embargo by smuggling uh, back and forth, uh, primarily with the Canadian maritime provinces. And, and, and there, there are murders that, that happen on the Maine coast. Probably the ugliest incident that happens locally, well, actually there are a couple ugly incidents that, that happen, um, but there's, a, there's a, a fellow who gets tarred and feathered down in Portland Harbor, he's stripped naked and, and smeared with tar and rolled in feathers. This is in December and he's tied up and left on the deck of a ship in Portland Harbor overnight. Uh, must, must, have been, must have been a hard night. Uh, so, so main communities are, are really divided about this, and, and the, the federal government is frustrated that locals are breaking these laws and beating up their officials, so they, the Jefferson administration responds by sending the Navy up here to chase smugglers and also by manning coastal fortifications, often with locally recruited soldiers, by the U.S. Army. So the U.S. Army is enforcing these laws. And uh, one of these soldiers enlists from uh, Freeport, young young guy named Alan Winslow. Alan Winslow joins an artillery unit and he's sent to Fort Preble in South Portland. Well, you know, he, he's, he's, he's there to enforce the embargo. Uh, and and uh, the, the commander of this unit really thinks that smugglers are, are going to try and undermine his command and uh, is scared actually that smugglers are going to attack his, his small fort. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, young Winslow is able to prevail on his captain to get leave in Freeport for a weekend. Uh, and, and Winslow does something that uh, young fellows returning to their hometown do. Uh, he goes to a, to a tavern and, and starts talking with people and probably having a couple drinks. And he's horrified to learn that his townspeople are telling him that he joined a force, the United States Army, that is going to be used to bayonet and shoot his cousins his friends and his neighbors uh, in enforcing this embargo. That, that he has essentially betrayed his community by joining the United States Army. And, and Winslow is horrified at this spot and, and he does something, something desperate and something stupid. Uh, he, he goes out, uh, I think it's to his woodshed, uh, and he cuts off the tips of his left hand. Oh. The idea being he won't be able to serve anymore. And he, and he shows up back in Fort Preble, bandages, sir, with all, all respect, I don't think I can serve the country anymore. I'm, I'm incapacitated. And the captain looks at his hand, and, 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 and Winslow also petitions Washington on this basis. And he writes back, well, you know, uh, young Winslow did this, but uh, it's only his left hand. It's only the tips of his fingers. I think he's going to gonna work out for the, the rest of his enlistment just fine. So he does not, in fact, get released. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, young Alan Winslow was all that smart. <laughs> I mean, if he'd done his right hand, I think it would have been a lot more convincing. But uh, uh, anyway, so but but it, 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 I, I think it, it, it's a, it's a great illustration of how how desperate and unhappy people were during the embargo. Let's see, my telephone is not going to move this forward. Uh, Okay, so oh, that, that, that's the stuff I was just talking about. Uh, tar and feathers in Portland. This is Fort Preble, as it would have looked about that period. And uh, Private Winslow, very desperate, as I mentioned before. Okay. 
So the United States Congress declares war in 1812, June of 1812, against Britain. And, and the reasons that are given when, when Congress declares war because President Madison, who succeeded Jefferson, comes to Congress and, and gives a list of grievances against the British and asks Congress to declare war, because of course it's Congress that, that declares war, not the President. Uh, and, he, and he gives reasons that are almost all maritime. It has to do with impressment and bothering American ships and interfering with our trade. And you know, there, there's only one thing that that really isn't maritime, and that's that the British. He claims the British are inciting Western Indians in that area of Michigan. Uh, but that having been said, uh, although Madison had been working towards declaring war on. Britain for a very long time, he had done absolutely nothing to prepare the nation for this war. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, while Britain's problems with us were largely maritime, that the United States was going to address these problems by invading Canada and holding it hostage. Uh, and that we would just use militia to do that and be cheap and quick. So even though by the end of 1811, Madison knows there's going to be a war with Britain, he does nothing, literally does nothing to increase the size of the United States Navy. It, it's, it's just a, a remarkable thought process that must have been going through his head because uh, he and Congress do not order any more ships to be built. Uh, they do not order the expansion of, of the Navy in any way, shape, or form, even though they are going up against the foremost naval power in the world. Uh, it's just inexplicable to me. Uh, very strange. Uh, Maine's response is uh, divided because Maine communities really were divided by these politics and, and these ideas. There are a lot of people who join up uh, in the military, uh, and there are a lot of people who don't and really resent the people who do. Uh, there are maritime communities, especially where you would expect a lot of privateers, but no, their politics, they don't really like Jefferson and Madison after the embargo, and they're not going to do that. Uh, Freeport and the, the porters in Freeport are an exception, and they, they will uh, go into the privateering business. And I'll get into what privateers are in a second, but it's a, it's a form of supporting the war, usually. <laughs> uh, I apologize for this map. The lettering's way too small. I'm just learning how to make maps, and, and one of my many sins is that I, I never make the lettering big enough. Um, because when you're working on a little computer screen, you, you never realize what it's going to look like on what's projected on a wall. So the, the big view uh, of Maine and the War of 1812 uh, is you've got the District of Maine. We're still a part of Massachusetts until 1820. We are neighbored by New Brunswick, which is now part of Canada. It's a British province. It's a province founded by loyalists. Tories who fled the United States at the end of the American Revolution. And so that's their, their enemies. And Nova Scotia here is another British province, and that is home to Halifax, which is a major British naval base. In fact, it is the British naval base on this side of the Atlantic that we have to worry about, and it is uncomfortably close to coastal Maine. Uh, so what happens in the Gulf of Maine during the war? Well, we, we know there is a, a frigate duel down here between the British frigate Shannon and the Chesapeake, which is captured by, by the British frigate right off Boston. Um, here on the mid-coast, uh, in September of 1813, there's a battle between an American brig, the Enterprise, and a British brig called the Boxer, in which, which the Americans win, and that, and that uh, vessel is brought into uh, Portland Harbor, uh, and then uh, in the summer of 1814, things start to go very, very wrong in Maine. Uh, in July of 1814, the British invade Eastport and seize that. Uh, on September 1st, they invade Penobscot Bay, capture Castine, move on towards Bangor, defeat uh, Amer uh, Maine militia uh, in Hamden, and then proceed to go on to plunder Bangor. And for the rest, and then shortly after that, they occupy Machias as well without much of a fight. So for the last nine months of the war, the stripy area here, eastern Maine, is occupied by the British, uh, and the American government.
Yemen by this time is broke. You've suffered military defeat after military defeat. The capital has been burned. Uh, we're, we're not doing very well. Luckily, we do much better in, in the peace. So, so that, that's, that's sort of my interpretation. I, I created this map, and I, but I don't think it's, it's very satisfactory, and I don't think it's very imaginative. So I, what I, I tried to do was create a different map that reflects a, a mariner's view of the theater of war in Maine waters. Um, so I got rid of the borders and, and, and all that stuff, and, and sailors are going to look at this war in a fundamentally different way. They're not going to be so worried about where the border is and whatnot, but there is, there is a maritime geography that they're going to take into consideration. Um, and all these little sort of funny green blobs out here at sea, you know, most maps, the ocean is just blue, right? Uh, I don't, I don't think mariners in 1812 are looking at it that way. And one of the things they would see out at sea are fishing banks. Uh, and fishing banks are important for the war at sea because fishermen are neutral. No, nobody harasses fishermen uh, during the war. The understanding is, is that they're just honest people out there plying their trade, so you don't harass them. Uh, and fishermen, in return, for basically any unit, British or American, they don't care, uh, any unit that comes by and asks questions, where are we, can you give me our approximate location, did a certain ship pass by recently, the fishermen will talk, they'll give you information. So fishing banks can be wonderful in this war uh, because you can get information from, from the fishermen, uh, and that's, that's rare. Another part of the geography out here is fog. And this map has been designed to illustrate how foggy it is in July in the Gulf of Maine. And, and the answer is very. Okay. Uh, that if you're out way out in the Atlantic, it's, it's only foggy about 10% of, of uh, the time. But as you move into the Gulf of Maine, it gets up to about 50% of the time in July. And this is from a, a navigation map collected in the, the 1890s, I suppose. Uh, so half the time in July, it's foggy out there. And if you're conducting warfare in the Gulf of Maine, before radar, that's, that's going to really impact how you operate. If you're a, a small unit and you're there to dash out and grab enemy merchant ships, that's great. You think you can hide in the fog. Uh, on the other hand, if you see a, a, a shape in, in the fog and, and you sail towards it, you think you're going to snap it up, oh, all of a sudden you can discover, no, actually, that's a big British warship with all its guns run out, and <laughs> your, your war is over. So, so f f fog is, is a big deal, and, we, and in studying the, the records out there, time after time, we're finding uh, these sort of incidents. And fog, of course, for a long time, uh, has been an analogy for the confusion of war. Uh, Karl von Clausewitz, the, the, one of the great military theorists in, in the 19th century, uh, talks about something called the fog of war, which I think is really appropriate for the Gulf of Maine, given the conditions. And, and the fog of war is this idea that you, you never really know what the enemy is doing. And, and for the timid, or those who aren't really clear thinkers, you can befuddle yourself and allow yourself to think that, boy, the, the enemy, he's, he's everywhere, uh, or you, you, you just don't know. You, you can really get yourself worked up and confused about this. And, and certainly, uh, some people get befuddled and confused by this, uh, and, and uh, you know, as a result, aren't as aggressive as they should be, uh, and the British play this up. The British have been at war a lot, they're much more experienced, the Americans are not, uh, and so the, the British know that just a couple ships can really sow a lot of confusion along the New England <coughs> coast. Uh, the Americans manipulate this to a certain extent, too, on the coast of Maine, but in a different way. There are a number of very small forts along the, the Maine coast, say Fort Popham or, 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 or uh, Fort Edgecombe, or Fort in Eastport and Machias, and they're not always occupied. And basically what the American government is doing is playing a sort of a shell game. You know, the British Navy sees a fort and usually assumes that it's fully garrisoned and ready to go, 
when in fact only about half the time does the American government have troops there because they don't really want to fight a war in the Gulf of Maine. They're trying to invade Canada and have pulled all the soldiers away. Uh, and indeed, so, so, you know, guys from Freeport are, are marched off to Canada, places like upstate New York, uh, to fight the British rather than fight the war right here. Um, all right, and, and there, there's some other things the sailors are going to see about this geography as well, that headlands are, are going to be much more important for a, a, a sailor. Not really worry about where the borders are, but if there's a nice mountain like Mount Agameticus or, or uh, uh, Isle of Ho or something like that, that's going to be important because you can figure out where you are by, by sighting them. Uh, and then there are little spots of land like Sable Island, which is part of Nova Scotia, way out here on the sailing banks. Those can be important, too, because it's a navigational hazard. In fact, a, a, at least two British warships will wreck on Sable Island uh, over the course of the War of 1812. Uh, and actually, the, the British are going to lose more ships to, to shipwreck in the War of 1812 than they will to uh, American military action, and naval vessels, that is. Can you just mention the comparative size of the navies at the time? At least sure. The Brits operating here. Uh, I, I believe, all told, that the United States Navy has a grand total of something like, at the beginning of the war, something like 24 armed vessels. Uh, Royal Navy, something like 900. Well, yeah. Operating here. Operating here. I'm oh, operating here. Uh, yeah, those numbers are pretty well known. They're actually printed in, in the newspapers of the day. Uh, the British have more ships operating out of their one base. In Halifax than the, the entire United States Navy. Uh, and some of those are, are considerably larger than our largest ships as well. So our, our Navy is tiny. It's, it's quite good uh, and will hand the British some unexpected defeats. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it is tiny. Uh, and, and ultimately, a British blockade along our coast, the, the British basically park their Navy along our coast and don't allow any trade in or out. Uh, and as a result of those blockades, the American economy collapses. Mm -hmm. So that, that's important. Um, the other uh, geographic issue to get back to these fishing banks is that fishing banks can be great if the fishermen are out there and willing to give you information. But uh, there's another element to these fishing banks in that they can be uh, very perilous to navigate. Uh, and the tricky one is the one down here by my hometown there. Uh, it's called George's Bank. Uh, and George's Bank isn't fished much yet. They don't really start fishing on it until the 1820s because there are so many fish closer to home. Uh, but George's Bank, parts of it are only two fathoms deep at low water, which is not a lot of water. Uh, and there are vicious rips, tidal currents that run across it. Uh, and uh, the, the problem with that is that in, in the winter, especially when there are bad storms, that, that becomes a very nasty area to navigate. Uh, and there are a couple of things that could happen to a vessel. It could potentially ground, hit the bottom in a, in a storm, uh, and, and be torn apart very quickly uh, is, is, is the big one. Uh, another one, uh, another potential scenario is that in these big waves, even if there's a fair amount of water over the bank, is the trough of the wave may be such that uh, a vessel gets picked up by a wave uh, and then is in the trough of a wave and bounces off the bottom and hits the, hits the bank and, and will break <coughs> its back and, 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 and will fall apart uh, very quickly. Um, so these, these banks are useful, but they're also dangerous. And there are no buoys, there are no aids to navigation, there are no <laughs> internal bulkheads that provide flotation in these vessels. Uh, they're very dangerous uh, in, in that sense. No, not much provision for safety. Okay. The kind of vessels uh, we're primarily interested here in Freeport are, are privateers, uh, which are armed vessels, but they are not part of the United States Navy. These are commercial vessels that have been, been empowered by the United States government to sail out and attack the nation's enemies, in this case, British. Uh, and uh, uh, there are rules, laws, and regulations about how they can do that. When a privateer sails out, it can grab an enemy commercial ship. Privateers are primarily about grabbing enemy commercial 
commercial vessels, not fighting naval vessels. They can seize that vessel and sail it back to the United States, hand it over to a federal court, which will then sort out the facts of the matter. And if that was a legitimate capture, uh, then the government will auction off that vessel and will give the proceeds back to the privateers. So it's a way to bring war to the enemy. It costs the United States government nothing. Uh, but it, you get these armed vessels out there attacking the enemy. Uh, and the incentive to do that for the privateersmen is you can get rich. You can get very wealthy by doing this. Uh, and the privateersmen are actually not paid monthly wages to conduct this sort of warfare. They're like fishermen. They get a share of whatever they capture. So if they, if they are lucky, they go out, they grab American vessels, bring them back. Uh, great, you can make a whole lot of money. On the other hand, if you fail to find enemy vessels, uh, you come back and you get nothing. Uh, worse yet, if you go out there and you get captured by the British, you're going to go to a British prison uh, and spend the rest of the war uh, there, which is not a very pleasant fate. Um, so it's risky. It's risky, but uh, it, it, it does have its charms. It's usually a, a fairly short engagement in which you, you, you could get a lot of money. The key to privateering is not the kind of vessel necessarily. There were rowboat privateers, especially here on the coast of Maine. Uh, there were big brigantines <laughs> like, like the Dash. Uh, but the, the key to all this, what makes a privateer a privateer, is its license. Uh, and this is a license uh, that's down in Washington, D.C., to a North Yarmouth privateer called the Lucy. Um, the Lucy wasn't very big. It was, it was, I think it was just a fishing schooner, basically, that had been converted into a privateer. And a lot of privateers are like that, quite, quite small. Uh, the commission or license for, for these privateersmen is signed by two people. One would be the President of the United States, and the other would be the Secretary of State. So uh, in the case of the Lucy and, and all privateers in the War of 1812, the President of the United States is James Madison, and the Secretary of State is, uh, for most of the war, James Monroe, uh, who will later be President of the United States. So uh, these documents are, are very collectible. If you happen to have one up in the attic, <laughs> <laughs> so, Maine sends out a lot of prize teams, uh, and this is as complete a list as I've come up with uh, working with some Canadian colleagues uh, to figure this out because there, there, there is no grand, accurate master list of, of privateers in the country. Uh, and I, I came up with this uh, map to show where. Maine's privateers were coming from, uh, and of course the, the, the big bruiser here is Portland produces 35 uh, privateers during the War of 1812. And of course Portland was even then the, the, the big city, uh, that's where the capital is, and, and that's where uh, the office that issues these licenses is, is based. Uh, that's a, a guy called the customs collector issues these. Uh, and so the dash would be amongst these. And, and this, this number is a little funny. It doesn't, it doesn't represent 35 different ships. It represents 35 commissions. So the dash had multiple commissions because it went out multiple times. So that's not the, the number of hulls. Uh, North Yarmouth sends out three. Uh, they're quite small. Uh, and there, there's one. Uh, I think that's the Drinkwater family. It tends, tends to dominate uh, North Yarmouth political affairs. Um, and, but there, there are a lot of main ports that do send these out. The biggest, of course, from Portland. Um, all of the ones east of the Penobscot River are really small. Uh, one of the, the, the smallest one I've found so far is one from Eastport, uh, and that was only two tons burden. Okay, So you're talking about a rowboat. That was about 24 feet long. What were they Well, if you you could you could nip out and 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 uh, grab somebody if, if you're clever, or you <laughs> it, it's some people abuse these commissions and become privateers, but not to bring war to the enemy, but to engage in a form of smuggling where essentially they 
capture a British ship by appointment. It's what's called a sham capture. And uh, it's all prearranged. <laughs> How much commercial traffic was there off the coast? Because uh, obviously England wasn't selling us anything. Uh, we weren't buying anything from them. No, but uh, here's, here's how it works. Uh, St. John, New Brunswick, up here. Uh, New Brunswick is a, a, a British province, as is Nova Scotia. Uh, those guys are, are very willing to import British stuff, which the American market wants oh, badly, see. right? They can do that entirely legally. Then the trick is, you know, think about uh, basic laws of supply and demand. Well, the, the American Republic is quite a large market, and it's got a huge thirst for British manufactured goods, things like cloth and hardware and other materials. So during war, when trade is theoretically cut off for the British, the prices for those things in the United States zoom up. So there's all sorts of incentive to smuggle across the border and engage in trade with the enemy which is, you know, could be construed as treason, at which point it could be, you know, <laughs> it, it, it can become very ugly. Uh, and there's a lot of hanky-panky with these privateers. Uh, we'll, we'll get into some more of that later on. Um, so uh, uh, Maine has a lot of privateers. This, 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 this is a much bigger number than I ever expected to find. Uh, they're not talked about a whole lot, with some exceptions like the Dash, uh, out of Freeport, or the, the Young Turk that's built in Wiscasset, and, and one or two others. But those are the, the bigger ones. Uh, uh, and they, uh, oh dear, I should, should have changed that lettering. Uh, the Dash is, 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 is one of the bigger ones, and, and uh, built here in Freeport, uh, and uh, probably some of you have seen this model in, in the library here. It's called the Hawk's Nest model, and it, and it sh displays the lines of the dash, uh, and is a, is a very early example of a model used to build a hull here in Maine. Because most ships built in Maine were built without plans, they're built out in the open air, and they're built on a, uh, what I call a by guess or by God method, where they sort of line up the frames, uh, and uh, uh, it's not a scientific process. And what this means is that a, a lot of main ships, the hull is differently shaped on the port side than it is on the starboard side. <laughs> so it will actually, those vessels had different sailing qualities, entirely different sailing <coughs> qualities, depending on what tack you are on. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, not a problem with the dash. Uh, it is planned out. It's, it's uh, the, the earliest example of, I know of in, in Maine uh, of this sort of thing being done. Uh, and uh, I, can't, I can't remember which the next slide is. That's sort of my take of, of this is a Coast Guard illustration, but I think that's, you know, to me, looks a lot, I think, what, what the dash would have looked like. And it's, it's actually pretty similar to some of the representations here I've seen at the Society. Uh, what I, know, I noticed about the dash is, is, is it is, you know, purpose built for speed and to carry armament, um, and, and that makes it different from most main vessels, which are built to carry a lot of stuff. They weren't so concerned about speed, uh, but they were interested in cargo carrying capacity, whereas, whereas dash is taking some cues from mid-Atlantic uh, and Chesapeake shipbuilders were beginning to build very fast schooners called Baltimore Clippers. Uh, and these vessels are, uh, they're fast without doubt, but, but they've, they've got their drawbacks as well. You can see, I, I suspect Dash uh, was a pretty wet vessel uh, up forward. Uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, has very fine lines and carries a lot of sail area. So it, it is a, a dangerous vessel to sail uh, that would be very prone to capsizing. And, and this, in fact, is the case for a number of War of 1812 privateers that sail out and simply disappear. And the Dash is just one of these. Uh, there, there are many others. Now, it's interesting, if you fast forward to the 20th century, in the 1980s, the city of Baltimore is very proud of these Baltimore Clippers and builds a a version of these privateer vessels called the Pride of Baltimore, uh, which of course uh, sails for a couple of years and goes out and of course what happens to it, it capsizes uh, with the death of four of its crew of 12. Okay. Well, you know, Baltimore, hello, you, you, sh you should have known. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they have since built a, a vessel called the uh, Pride of Baltimore II, which is, which is a little more conservative. Uh, 
another problem that these privateers have is not only the vast areas, sail area they have, but uh, they're carrying armament on deck. Cannons are, are really heavy, so they have, have raised... Uh, CG. Yeah, yeah, CG, <laughs> there, there, there you go. Moment arm and all, all, all that stuff. Uh, you, you, they're, they're not a very stable craft because of that as well. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll get into the fate of, of the Dash in, in a bit. Uh, the Dash, however, uh, its, its early cruises are not about taking the war to the enemy so much. Uh, in its early cruises, it acts as what's called a letter of mark capacity, which, which is to say it still has a license from the federal government to be a privateer and to seize enemy ships. But its primary purpose is not to seize British ships, but to carry a cargo very fast. It's essentially a blockade runner. But if they run across an unarmed, likely British target, they still have the license to take it over. And the place where they're going to uh, is from Portland to uh, uh, down here to what's now the Dominican Republic. Uh, and they're, they're trading down there for West India goods. And it does two voyages down there to the island of Hispaniola. Um, and, and this was pretty common. A lot of people before the War of 1812 had been running fast vessels like this down to uh, the French islands in the Caribbean that the British were trying to blockade, and, and American vessels were sneaking through that blockade and supplying the French and getting paid a lot of money to do it. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if it comes inside or outside of Bermuda on these voyages. I don't think the early logbooks survive. But uh, Bermuda, of course, is a British naval base. Um, so you have to be careful. But I'm, I'm guessing on prevailing winds uh, that they're swinging way out into the Atlantic and letting the trade winds ca ca carry them into Hispaniola. Uh, and then, of course, you, you have to sneak back through the British. And a lot of the American coast, represented by this red line here, is uh, under British blockade, say British warships, often at anchor off the American coast, just waiting to capture ships coming in and out. The British, however, don't blockade New England early in the war because uh, the head British military officials in Halifax know that New England doesn't really like this war. So they take it easy on New England because they're trying to separate New England from the rest of the country. And they do a pretty darn good job. Uh, the New Englanders respond to that pretty well. So, so uh, there are some British ships off the New England coast, but that it's not a harsh blockade like it is off, off the rest of the sea. Um, the, the, the career of the Dash is well known, and, it, and it's well represented here uh, in the Historical Society uh, and in the library, so I'm not going to go through it blow by blow. Um, but, but I do think it's worth mentioning the, the last and final cruise of, of, the, uh, of the Dash, uh, which is in the, the very last days of the war. It, it's in January of 1815, which is a horrible winter. Penobscot Bay freezes over, and, and you can drive horse teams across it. It's that cold. Very, very nasty winter. Uh, and, uh, but the owners of the Dash uh, want to get one more cruise in. And, and by now, the Dash has been converted to a full-time privateer. Not interested in carrying cargo anymore. It's all just sailors and guns. They're going to go out and seize British ships and hopefully become wealthy doing so. And the Dash had been very successful in, in doing this earlier in the war. So in January of 1815, uh, and if you remember your high school history, uh, the war technically is, ends on Christmas Eve of 1814, but the news had not gotten back to the United States or been ratified by Congress yet. Um, so uh, in many ways, the war is over. But, but Dash goes out one last time in company with a, another privateer from New Hampshire. And they're sort of racing across the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and, and then uh, the New Hampshire privateer loses sight of the Dash and, and is gone. It, it never comes back. Um, and uh, this is uh, one of the Porter boys here from Freeport. This is the guy in command. Uh, his brothers, or older brothers, are the owners, and, and they're hoping for months, and they're writing for months. Oh, gee, just, just waiting for the ship to come back. And it never does. Uh, and, and we'll never really know what happened to the Dash, but uh, I've got some ideas. Uh, and, and those ideas involve the way the Dash was designed uh, to be a very fast 
vessel uh, uh, and one with too much sail area and, and not enough attention paid to stability. Uh, and the fact that it goes out to George's Bank, that area that, that is very dangerous to navigate, especially in a winter as nasty as, as the winter of 1815. Uh, and uh, I suspect it, it, it may have bounced off the bottom uh, or, or it may have just simply capsized uh, in, in a storm, which was the outlet. Now what I think is interesting about the loss of the dash in this area is that in almost exactly the same area, in a vessel that is very close, close to what the dashes was, a, a vessel called the Rolla, another privateer that had been built in Baltimore, but had been captured uh, by the British and was now operating as a Canadian privateer out of the port of Liverpool, Nova Scotia, was operating in the area of George's Bank at exactly <coughs> the same time. It had been up here uh, in Nantucket Sound and had captured a vessel uh, and it was sailing back to uh, Nova Scotia at, at, at the end of January about the same time and it too disappeared with all hands. Uh, thereby widowing 44 women in uh, Liverpool, Nova Scotia, and making orphans of over 80 children. Right? Daddy's gone. He's not coming back. Uh, but you don't know that. That's, this is the thing. I mean, there's, there is no funeral. There, there, there is no corpse. It's just gone. They, they sailed out, and they never came back. And I don't know how many widows and orphans were, were here in Freeport and Portland, but it's, it's a number of them. And, and we know something about some of these widow ladies as well. Same area, same design, that the, this, these Chesapeake-influenced uh, 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 clippers simply had no business being out in the Gulf of Maine in January of 1815, or January of any year, uh, because they, they were essentially a flawed design. Uh, and the, the Rolla also disappears, nothing ever heard about it. A, a couple boards may have washed up on shore in Massachusetts, but that's that's not confirmed as of yet. So th this is this is not unheard of. All right. So again, uh, there, there there's st stability issues uh, with the uh, uh, fame and, and these uh, Chesapeake Clippers. That you know, uh, th these things are always healed over on the ocean, but. Uh, is there a naval architect in the house? It's, uh, th this stuff is complicated. You have, of course, uh, a, a, a vessel is heavy and it presses down, um, but uh, the ocean pushes back, uh, and that's buoyancy. Uh, and on in this scenario, you know, your center of weight is somewhere here, and your center of buoyancy is, is probably something over there because the ocean's trying to push back harder on that side. And of course you have uh, this enormous amount of sail area which is acting as an enormous crank. But that's, that's normal on sailing vessels, right? They, they heal over, that's, that's, that's not a problem. Something happened though, uh, and, 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 and it healed over probably, in, in my mind, too far. Uh, and then strange things start to happen. The uh, center of weight uh, and the center of buoyancy uh, begin to move over that way. Um, you're going to get water coming coming down hatches if they're not secured, which is what this is. Uh, guns can break loose even if they're they're lashed on this bulkhead can come come crashing down. You know, a, 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 you, you get into this downward spiral, and, and if you study maritime tragedies, there, there's always this these stages that that rapidly escalate. It's almost never one reason. It's several reasons that can verge to produce a disaster. And, and that must, something along those lines, I think, is probably what happened to the dash. Um, if it's any consolation, I, I, I don't think these guys suffered very long. Not that water. Uh, no, no, not, not in January. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's uh, uh, un undoubtedly was a, was a terrifying but brief death. Um, Okay, so that's the dash. Now the dash is owned by, uh, largely owned, not completely owned, but, but uh, uh, largely owned by the Porter family who, who has deep, deep Freeport roots. Uh, Samuel and 
sewer porter. And, and of course, in local histories, these guys have been celebrated. They are great patriots who, who run uh, privateers and attack the British. Uh, Seward Porter is an especially interesting guy because he's the guy who brings the first steamboat to Maine and opens steam navigation in coastal Maine. So he, he's a clever fellow. He, he is an interesting guy. Yet, um, there is some murky behavior on their part, uh, which, which makes you think that, sure, uh, patriotism may have been part of their worldview, but I think at, at the heart of it, that the, the porters are, mm, they're New England Yankees. Um, and I, 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 I'm a New England Yankee. But, uh, you know, there's that thing about money, right? <laughs> and, and it's not always pleasant. Uh, Yankees are, are notoriously cheap, uh, and, and they pursued coin with, with too much relish, and, and they, they weren't afraid to engage in the slave trade uh, or do other dubious things in pursuit of loot. So while, while I may be a Yankee, I'm, I'm aware that we, we, we are also responsible for visiting some pretty horrible things on, on people as well. Um, and, and the porters fit this bill. Uh, it, it's never been revealed in local histories, but in going through federal court records, uh, I found that the Sewards were involved in illicit trade, if not flat out smuggling, uh, during, during the War of 1812. Not only were they raiding British shipping, but they were also conducting trade with the British at the same time. Okay. And how they're doing that is uh, uh, they had ordered a large amount of uh, British manufactured goods uh, maybe right before the war, or maybe early in the war, it's not clear. Mostly um, crockery ware, pottery, basically. Um, and they had that delivered to Canada. Um, let me go ahead here for a second. Uh, and taken to uh, a town just across from the main border called St. Andrews, New Brunswick. Uh, and here's Eastport and there's Lubeck, okay? Um, and what, what they did is a, they had one of their Freeport pals, I can't remember his name, but he, he operated a sloop out of Freeport called the Sally. Um, I, could, I could find the, the man's name if you're interested. And they, they, he tried to bring this cargo from, oops, uh, from St. Andrews uh, and get it into the United States, but got caught. Uh, and the, uh, 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 the issue went to a federal court. Now, it, it isn't clear to me yet whether the porters actually were, were just victims of circumstance, that they've ordered this cargo before the war, the war breaks up, uh-oh, they've got all this stuff on the wrong side of the border, and they're out a lot of money. The porters took some pretty big financial hits during the war, and it, in fact, it's the, the privateer dash that really keeps them afloat during the war. Uh, so they're, they're broke. Uh, so there, there is some thought that they actually uh, purposely turned themselves in to the federal government, sort of threw themselves on the mercy of the court. We're, we're really just trying to reclaim this property that was caught on the wrong side of the border. Um, but they do pay a big fine, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm not sure how the rest of the story plays out, mostly because I'm, I'm not actually very good at figuring out the legalese stuff. You know, it's a lot of paperwork, but it's you know <laughs> legal jargon. Uh, then there's, there's some even more disturbing stuff. Um, the porters own a ship called the Baltic. And this, this ship is captured by the British with a cargo down towards the Caribbean. Uh, the British let it go, though. The British let it go because the Baltic had what is called a Sidman license. That is, the, the Porter family had actually purchased a license from the British that allowed American ships to conduct trade with Britain uh, and would protect them from capture. And so what this means is that the Porters had to purchase this document from the British. The British didn't hand these out for free. They, 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 they got paid for this. 
Um, so again, we have at least two instances of the porters conducting trade with the enemy during the War of 1812. And again, and this is not from American records, this is actually from uh, the British Vice Admiralty Court records in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Okay. So this, this is not conjecture, it's not rumor. It's the legal facts. Um, and then there's a really weird letter that I found in Nova Scotia. Uh, and, and I think I'll, sh I'll show it to you um, because it's, uh, uh, it, it really confuses me and I, I'm not sure exactly how to interpret it. Um, so maybe you can interpret it for me. Uh, this, this is a, you know, I've, I've typed it up, but this is this I found in Halifax as well. So Seward Porter is the big deal to the Porter brothers who owns the Dash. This is a letter from him to the British Admiral in charge of, of the Royal Navy in all North American waters and to the uh, Lieutenant Governor of, of Nova Scotia, an Army General named Sherbrooke. Um, and uh, uh, so here you have this letter where Seward Porter is writing to the enemy in Halifax. And he's being very polite. I, I'd say he's almost being obsequious. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's got all the titles, right? You know, I mean, he, he's, he's being super, super polite. Um, he's claiming to be from Boston. I'm, I'm not sure why. Um, and he talks about, you know, we know Seward Porter is, in fact, a member of the House of Representatives in of the State Assembly, which is we're part of Massachusetts. Uh, this further identifies him. And, um, you know, he's saying, you know I'm, I'm a rich guy. I'm an important business guy. I've, I've got extensive mercantile transactions in various branches of the West India and European trade. We already know that. That's, that's true about Seward Port. Uh, and, but, you know, this war with Great Britain has interfered. Um, <laughs> but that the said state of Massachusetts was decidedly averse to the war. But we, we Yankees, we're not interested in this war. This is, the, this is Madison and Jefferson and those cats. Um, we don't want the war. Um, but all these merchants in Massachusetts want to do is conduct trade. And they want to continue this trade. Um, but they're worried that the, the American federal government, or general government, uh, is interfering with trade, for example, by... Um, arresting people who bought British licenses to conduct trade, which we know Porter has been doing because of the Baltic. Uh, and and, and uh, he's, he's complaining about the American government, and, and he wants to import stuff. Uh, and he's saying that uh, he wants to be allowed to carry stuff from Halifax to the United States, and that he will deposit $50,000 in coin. Right? Cash on the barrel head. It's a guarantee for my good behavior to do this. Um, and the idea is that Seward Porter here, you know, he starts talking about privateers, that, that he's talking about committing this, these sham captures I was talking about before these collusive captures. And we know that this, this is, I think this is in 1813, it's at that low point for the Porter's financial fortunes, when they're, they're really in a, in a tough spot. Uh, and so Seward Porter is proposing to uh, abuse privateering uh, and conduct these collusive captures. And, uh, And not only is he going to do that, but in return, he's also going to bring food to the British. And food is always a cru in, in low supply in Nova Scotia. The British have a hard time feeding their troops and sailors. Look, but Seward Porter is saying, I'm going to bring you flour, beef, and pork. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm really going to, going to help you out. Um, and, and he's even saying, we can do this at a profit because privateers that capture British goods get taxed very lightly when they come to the United States. So, so it works out too. <coughs> Signed, Seward Porter, um, AKA Benedict Arnold. Um, <laughs> what, uh, although I'm not convinced of that. I'm, I'm, I'm being much 
much too harsh on Stuart Porter. Uh, I'm a little confused by this letter. It, I have no doubt it's, it's genuine. I mean, it's just lying out there in Canada. It, Canadians don't, don't care about this. They don't care about Stuart Porter. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm a little confused about Porter's intentions. Is this, do we read this on the surface and say, Stuart Porter is, is clearly sold out and, and in fact is engaging in a treasonous trade with the British? Um, it's a possibility. It sure looks like that. I, I, I suppose an argument could be made that Seward Porter is, is being very clever and, and maybe trying to uh, intercept the smuggling trade and, and, and uh, uh, claim, you know, come out and claim he's, he's, he got this encouragement from the British so he could rat out other people. So maybe he's being, you know, sort of doing this agent provocateur or espionage kind of stuff. I don't think it's likely. Um, so this is a, a, a profoundly troubling letter that I think really brings a, a new light on the Porters. And I, I admire Porter on so many levels, you know, with a, as a merchant mariner myself, and you know, he brings steam navigation here and all that stuff. Great, owns the dash. And, and maybe this was just a, a dark moment in his life when he proposed something desperate. Um, the British, as it turns out, do not act on. Uh, to my knowledge. Uh, so nothing comes of it, and he never puts up that $50,000. You can imagine what $50,000 was like in 1813. That's a, a whole lot of money. Uh, a whole lot of money now, uh, as I can tell you. But, uh, uh, so, so troubling stuff, and, and I hope that, that letter alone has, has made uh, this talk worthwhile to at least, you know, I, I think, as a historian, it's important to, to celebrate the past, but I, I think it's also important to, to, to question and, and, and push back a little bit and, and, and think hard about things and, and what was going on there. So uh, there, there's Seward's damning letter in 1813. Here, here's another funny thing about the, uh, the Seward's uh, and, and being cheap Yankees. Um, they got sued by the Dash's crew. You don't hear this much either. Uh, this didn't make it into the local history either. What the uh, Porters did was, and I, I don't think this had anything to do with the illicit trade or anything. I, I think uh, the, the Porters were cheap. They were cheap Yankees. And instead of paying their crew in shares, as most privateers did, uh, they did something that was unconventional, they paid the monthly wages. And then when the Dash captured enemy ships, those guys who were getting paid monthly wages didn't get a share of the, of the proceeds. Well, this happened to be a very successful cruise, uh, and so a couple of the crew, including at least one of the mates on board, uh, sued uh, the Porter family, saying, well, yeah, you, you guys paid us wages, but, but the but the contract we signed said we were going to get, you know, that, that there was some sort of misunderstanding there. Uh, in this case, the, the Porters win uh, uh, the case. They had a contract in hand that said, we're just going to pay, pay you wages. So uh, there you have it. I think the, the Porters were, uh, were cheap Yankees. Uh, <laughs> they, they, they wouldn't be the last, believe me. Uh, now, on, on, on the other side of the world, with the ordinary sailors, of course, there, there are a lot of Mainers who are privateersmen, and they will be captured, uh, and, and uh, many of these POWs end up in British prisons. This is uh, a, a drawing done uh, by a fellow from North Yarmouth who's a privateersman, uh, and this is, called, this is Dartmoor Prison in the southeast of England, uh, not far from a British naval base called Dartmouth. Uh, and uh, there were thousands of Americans there, many, many of them privateers. And uh, uh, after the war was over, much like the, the loss of the dash itself, uh, there was an unfortunate incident at this prison, which was a horrible prison. It, 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 people were dying of disease, and, and, and it was crowded, and it was filthy. Not, not a nice place to be at. Uh, what, what happened was some prisoners were playing ball, and the ball went over a fence, and, and uh, they shouted at a sentry to throw the ball back, and, and they were apparently sassing the guy. Uh, 
and, and gunfire broke out. So the war's already over, uh, but the British soldiers fire into this mob of prisoners and, and then later charge them with, with bayonets uh, and, and stab and, and kill uh, a number of the prisoners. And there are Mainers who die and, and Mainers who uh, uh, end up uh, permanently disabled as a result of this. It's, it's sort of a, a needless tragedy, but it, it, it's sort of a capstone to what had really been sort of a, a needless war as well. And uh, of course, after the war is over, as with any war, the, the people continue to suffer. And, and this, this is not actually a main woman, but uh, it gets back to this issue of widow's weeds. Of course, uh, back in those days, as, as, a, as a widow lady, uh, you were required for at least a year to, to wear black and, and white. You wore no, no bright colors. And these were referred to as widow's weeds. Uh, and there are a number of main women who, who, as a result of the war, will wear widow, widow's weeds. Uh, and some of these refuse to ever give up the widow's weeds. You're only supposed to wear them for one year, but if, but if you were completely destroyed by this event, some of these women wore widow's weeds for the rest of their life. Uh, and this is the case of uh, Aunt Hannah Roberts, who is related to the carpenter on board the Dash. Uh, she had a number of children by him. He sails out and never comes back. Uh, it takes her a while to come to terms with this, but she, she dons widow's weeds, even though there's, there's not a grave or anything. Until the day she dies, in 1855, she wears widow's weeds. So, you know, for, for, for decades, uh, she, she is doing this. And why is that? Well, because in those days, when, when the, the man, the, the provider was gone, economically, were destroyed, uh, that, that your ability to feed yourself and your children would have been severely curtailed, uh, that this war, like any war, uh, devastates families. Uh, I, you know, and it, 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 I've always been confused. Like when, when we go to war against somebody, why is it the first act we do is increase funding to the Veterans Administration? Because you know this is going to happen. Right? This, this is not a mystery. She actually gets a pension from the federal government from 1818 to the, to, to the end of her days because her husband served on a privateer. Uh, there's another example of a, a, a local boy, Thomas Sowell, who, whose family helped build the dash. He, he uh, is not on the dash, but he is imprisoned at some point during the war uh, and uh, is in Dartmoor in England. It's a horror show. He comes back and, and emotionally he is uh, destroyed by this war and, and ultimately will commit suicide in 1824. Uh, so grim stuff. I mean, that's that's what wars are. I, 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 I'm not convinced we, we need to celebrate wars. I mean, we celebrate our heroes and our, and our veterans, but uh, wars are, of course, terrible things. And, I, and I, I work for the federal government. I am part of the military industrial complex. I'm not a communist or a troublemaker or anything, but these, <laughs> these are, these are, these are, are, are bad things. Uh, for, for, but because it's a bad thing, you know, b bad things can lead to good things sometimes. And, and in the case of the state of Maine, the War of 1812 is, is going to lead to statehood. That uh, the people of Maine are so disgusted with the behavior of Massachusetts, largely in this war, uh, that they decide to push for statehood uh, in 1815 and ultimately will get statehood in 1820. Of course, Freeport plays a big role that too. And it's really the maritime communities that, that make the difference. That's where the population was, and, and William King will be the first governor of Maine, manages to, to manipulate uh, some maritime laws that, that make it good for Maine to separate from Massachusetts. So uh, the War of 1812 is often referred to as the catalyst for statehood for Maine. So uh, I think that's a good thing, unless you all think you should still live in Massachusetts. <laughs> Uh, and of course, it, it, it is a, a second American Revolution where we really establish we are different and separate from the British. Uh, and we get back to, to this image of, of the icon of the American sailor as really sort of the exemplar of the, of the young republic, uh, a real icon uh, promoting this idea that we are a, a free nation, that we have broken our chains, uh, and partly because of our glorious naval adventures against the British, and that we are an independent. Uh, that's, 
that's what I have to say for today. And uh, if you have any questions, I, I hope I've, uh, you know, I'm successful if I've caused your, your, your little gray cells to, to turn over a little bit. Uh, and I think I've challenged some, some local myths. Uh, and, and I'd love to uh, hear your response or, or your questions or, or whatnot. Yes, ma'am. The Battle of New Orleans was part of this. Um, yeah, Battle of New Orleans is, is also fought after the war is over uh, and in February of 1815. So the word had, was just percolating through the United States, but Congress had not yet ratified the peace treaty. Uh, there is a, a memorial uh, for somebody that was killed from Pownall. It's up in the woods at that funny little graveyard. Uh, I was over there and, and somebody took me to take a look. And so it's an office uh, with the guy's name on it and so on. So and, and he died at New Orleans? Or, or, or just in the war in general? I think it was New Orleans. No kidding. No, I, I haven't heard a lot about Mainers down there. I mean, it's a long, long way from Maine. But uh, there, there, there was a naval component to that battle, too, that not a lot of, I, I bet you it was a sail. Yes, sir, with a beer. Not so much a question as a comment from my grandfather. Your business about the uh, cold and the lack of, if the dash went down, didn't last long. Yeah. He did not, he refused to learn to swim. And he told me why, because he'd been on the Grand Banks as a young person. And if you could swim, it took you longer to die, and it was a lot more difficult. That's, that, that's exactly, that's what I heard as a kid growing up on Cape Cod, because we, we had fishermen out of Chatham who never learned to swim for exactly the same reason. You just, you just, you know, you're just going to die tired. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. People allowed today to go, you know, lobstering and they don't have to swim. Sure. Yeah. 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 Sure. It's a very pragmatic attitude. And, uh, <laughs> You know, it's it's a recognition that isn't always there, and I I, I think you know that nature is just this truly awesome force. That, you know, sometimes you just, just no, there's no point in struggling. Okay. I enjoyed your lecture very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, my family lived in Eastport during the British occupation, mm -hmm. and um, two young boys in my family were um, abducted, 12 and 13 years old. Mm -hmm and sent to Dartmoor. And I've always wondered whether they, what happened to them after the war. Do you know if Americans I, after the war were on? Um, I, I might, and, and Eastport's one of my favorite places in the world, and I wrote my first book about Eastport during the War of 1812. And I, I have a database, and it's on this computer, so, so maybe after the questions, I, I could try and, and look, look their names up. Yeah. Uh, is, what, do you have a family name? Layton. Oh boy, what a lot of ladies <laughs> out there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I'd, 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 I'd love to talk talk more. Yes, sir. Um, where the sale was from Dash or sort of reporters? Was it that at a court house somewhere around here? Uh, it, it, it started out, must have started out in the federal district court, but it actually goes all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. Wow. So it, it <laughs> and it takes years. So, uh, and you, you can actually, in Google Books, you, you can you can find that. It's, it's, it's there. Yes? Privateer? Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, all the time. And, and one of the nice things about signing on a privateer is not only could you get rich, but it was a pretty short term of service, so maybe you're only out a couple weeks or a couple months, and then, you, then you're back in court, and then you can hop on another privateer. So, oh yeah, that, that happens all the, all the time. Yeah, good, good That's question. Good question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, I've uh, been fascinated by this because I just got through reading a book called Sea of Grey, which is about a British captain's point of view patrolling the Caribbean, and San Domingo was mentioned, and it mentions yeah. all these privateers coming down. And it was just coincidental that I read that book. Then I picked up another book in a book sale by F. Van Wick Mason, written in 1940. It's called Stars on the Sea. And it is exactly about this same issue right here, of the privateers being built and commissioned by Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine, and all that. My question.
question to you is, was she a uh, brigantine or was she a topsail schooner? Because this over here is a brigantine in this illustration. Yeah. And then when you see the picture back there, she's a topsail schooner. Which was she? Uh, the, the answer is yes. <laughs> Starts out as a topsail schooner and then gets re rigged as a brigantine after ah. a second voyage or something, yeah, so, which really is very cool. common. I mean, there isn't much distinction between a brigantine and, and a schooner anyway. Right. It's a pretty subtle distinction. But yeah, they, they, they re rigged her. Uh, and I don't know if they got more speed out of her that way or maybe that maybe they were nervous that the schooner rig was, wasn't stable. I, I, I don't know exactly why they did that. Your illustration that you had of the schooner. Oh yeah, yeah, there was a yeah, yeah. Well, there's, a, there's a vessel right here from Maine known as the Day Spring that was captained by a gentleman right here from Freeport, uh, Bill Wasson, and this was probably the 1980s. I taught school with him for many years. He was yeah. a math teacher. His dream was to build a schooner yeah. and have a, a sailing schooner along the coast here, a, a dude schooner, yeah. take it to the Caribbean for the winter months and all that. Well, on his maiden voyage down to the Caribbean, everything went fine. And then on the way back, the same thing happened. Uh, she was a topsail schooner. He says he didn't have his topsail set, but the Coast Guard said he never was to set them. They, they gave him a stipulate never to set those because she wasn't licensed for them or didn't have yeah. papers for them. Well, she rolled over and went down and sank. And there was a loss of life there, too, wasn't there? What's that? Was there a loss of life? I can't remember. No, he had his wife uh, and his young son on board and one crew then. So they got <coughs> off and uh, she was gone. <coughs> it seems to me that the cargo ship was part of the problem, right? There was another one called the John F. Levitt. That no, that's the one I'm thinking. Yeah, she okay. had the same thing <coughs> after her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the tricky business. It's, it's, it's yeah. not easy. I mean, not, not a lot of people realize there's a... Uh, uh, I can think of one gentleman who would know, but uh, there, there used to be a real art to, to packing cargo on ships so, so that it didn't shift and, and move. Oh and with containerization, that's, that's by and large gone, not completely. Yes, sir? In deference to one of your early comments, uh, you struggled, quote unquote, to leave the state of Maine and go to New York City. Yeah. I struggled. <laughs> till 1959 to get out of New York City. <laughs> and I will tell you definitively right now, sir, <laughs> the best damn thing that ever happened to me besides marrying my wife. <laughs>